Welcome to Banfield, a short statement from the FBI and a possible murder confession scribbled in a notebook. This is how last year's most followed criminal investigation appears to have ended. Today, the FBI released the official findings from its investigation into the deaths of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. Since the FBI joined the case in September, we've all been waiting with bated breath for whatever they might uncover. How many of our questions would get answered? And now it seems we know just a few of them. The entire statement released by the feds today reads as follows. All lo logical investigative steps have been concluded in this case. The investigation did not identify any other individuals other than Brian Laundrie directly involved in the tragic death of Gabby Petito. The FBI's primary focus throughout the investigation was to bring justice to Gabby and her family. The public's role in helping us in this endeavor was invaluable as the investigation was covered in the media around the world. On behalf of the FBI, I want to express my deepest appreciation to the public for the thousands of tips that were provided during the investigation and to our local, state and federal law enforcement partners for their work throughout the investigation. Uh, you will notice that they used the phrase tragic death instead of murder or even killing, despite the fact they say Brian Laundrie was the only person involved. Today, Gabby Petito's family was much more forceful with the language they used, writing in part, we truly appreciate the FBI's diligent and painstaking efforts in this extremely complicated case. The quality and quantity of the facts and information collected by the FBI leave no doubt that Brian Laundrie murdered Gabby. The attorney for Laundrie's parents, Steve Berlino, also released a statement today saying Gabby and Brian are no longer with their families and this tragedy has caused enormous emotional pain and suffering to all who loved either or both of them. We can only hope that with today's closure of the case, each family can begin to heal and move forward and find peace in and with the memories of their children. I want to bring in the person who's been following this investigation longer than anyone. It's News Nation's Brian Enton. And Brian, I have to say, I am wholly dissatisfied uh, and, and just frustrated that we don't have some more definitive end to this, something where we felt somebody deserved to take the blame for this and not by saying Gabby had a tragic death. Well, Ashley, I think this does bring some closure to everything because you have to remember it's not until today that the FBI ever even said that Brian Laundrie was responsible for Gabby Petito's death. Uh, and that is now in black and white. Uh, and the FBI says this case is now closed. But you're right. I mean, it was one page long. Uh, all of this months and months and months and months of investigation, uh, and they released one page uh, with very, very little uh, amount of detail. Yeah. Like, how about what did they find in the investigation from the place where Gabby's body lay all the way to Florida? Because that man, Brian Laundry, did things. He did things from there on the way home. Okay, we knew about the debit card use. That's not news to us. But what about motive? What about evidence? What about anything that would say he wasn't just responsible, he did this to her? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were a few interesting new tidbits. You mentioned uh, the drive back to Florida. We had heard early on from Gabby's mom that the last text messages sent from Gabby's phone just didn't seem anything like her. You remember Ashley, Gabby was calling her grandpa Stan, something she would never do. Uh, for the first time today, the FBI did acknowledge that it was Brian Laundrie sending uh, those final text messages. So that was something new, something that we had already heard from her mom. Uh, also new uh, with the notebook, um, we know now that according to the FBI, uh, there was a, a note in the notebook and that 
what that note said shows that Brian was responsible for the death, but exactly what he said and what it might say about motive, they left all those details out. So that is my next question. Why on earth would you not just reveal what it was he said? He's dead. It's not like it's going to affect him, but at least it might give the rest of us some you know, feeling uh, a little more satisfying than he's responsible. Maybe he actually said something that was a lot more culpable. Why wouldn't they just say what it was that he wrote? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it would have been interesting to know, again, back to motive. I don't know what he wrote in the notebook, but I would assume it would elaborate on why he did what he did. Uh, I texted with uh, Mr. Bertolino tonight, the Laundry family attorney, trying to find out where the notebook is right now and what was in it. Uh, I asked him, where is it? Do the laundries have it? He said he wasn't going to answer that. And he also says uh, he's not commenting on what exactly was in the notebook. Okay, what else do we know about the, you know, dissolution of property? Obviously, that was a very long meeting yesterday. Has it been released? Who got what? I know there was $20,000, apparently, that Brian Laundry had. I would assume that the Laundry parents would get access to that. But what about all their shared belongings and, of course, that white van? So the specifics have not been released. Again, we know through the attorneys that there was this sort of discussion negotiation happening for quite some time about the property that, that would be released. And the uh, Petitos were at the FBI office in Tampa for eight and a half hours. Uh, and when they left, they did leave with several boxes. So we can assume that they were given some of uh, uh, Gabby's uh, items that were in evidence that may have been at the laundry's home or in the van. Uh, I can't imagine how difficult and emotional that must have been for them. Uh, we did not see the, the van leave the FBI office, and we know that's the last place that it was. Do we know if Gabby's family uh, was privy to a lot of the evidence that clearly they are not sharing with us right now, the, the authorities? Did they at least share some of these things with Gabby's family? Maybe give her uh, family a little more closure. Perhaps let them know what the contents of the notebook actually said? So we don't know for sure, um, but we know that they were there for eight and a half hours and they only left with several boxes. So we can assume that a large portion of that time, uh, it was FBI agents going over in detail um, the evidence uh, that they found. So I would imagine the Petitos have a lot more detail tonight than what we got today in that one-page document. Yeah, one, one more detail that came out from the FBI that surprised me. Uh, I knew that, you know, Brian Laundrie had been sending what seemed to be phony texts to Gabby's family. But then I want to just read this one little nugget in the release, which I thought was pretty um, eye-opening. After Ms. Petito's death, there were several text messages identified between Mr. Laundry's telephone and Ms. Petito's telephone. The timing and content of these messages are indicative of Mr. Laundry attempting to deceive law enforcement by giving the impression that Ms. Petito was alive. So he's got two phones and he's texting them back and forth to each other, maybe as he's driving to Florida to pretend nothing to see here. Gabby's just fine. I would like to know the content of those texts as well. Do they suggest they're going to release anything more in this investigation, Brian? I mean, it's possible. And when you brought that up, Ashley, I just started to think about all of the things that they do have that they didn't release, all of the interviews that they did and the surveillance video on his drive back from Wyoming to Florida. Uh, will we ever see it? I don't know. I mean, I've tried putting in public records request with the feds and the FBI on other cases in the past, and we will with this one too. It's usually very, very difficult and can literally take years uh, to get the documents. Uh, will there be another way? I mean, is it possible there's a civil suit in the future uh, where we may end up getting some of this evidence? Uh, we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, Brian, you've done a great job. Thank you for bringing this all to us today. So appreciated. I actually have someone who can answer that last question of yours, Brian. So I'm going to dig a little deeper into the legal ramifications of the FBI's findings. I'm joined now by Florida criminal defense attorney Mark Iglarsh. Before I get into that whole business of, you know, additional charges or potential civil action, I just want to get your reaction to this. Uh, I say it's like a document 
dump, not a document. Dump because it's a one pager <laughs> and it still leaves a ton of questions unanswered. Okay, we disagree, you and I. You know, I, ah. I'm not upset. I read what they put out there. I like that it's brief. I don't need briefs. I need a document. They tell me that he did it. We know how he did it. She died. He's responsible. He even admitted it. That's good enough for me. It sounds like you're frustrated like me and my wife are when we leave a movie and we say, you know, they didn't answer this. We don't know this. Mm -hmm. They don't owe you that, Ashley. They don't owe you all the questions that, that you want answered. They put out a statement. For me, it's good enough. You're right. They don't owe it to me. And maybe even to the viewers who will be very angry if I say that. But I think they <laughs> owe it to the Petitos to use the M word. Because up until now, it's been a killing, not even a murder, uh, not even a homicide. Well, it's a homicide, but, you know, it's not him behind the homicide. And responsible could mean I left her and then she died. I'm responsible. Wrong. There were strangulation marks around her. So why, with all of that hard evidence and a notebook to boot, why wouldn't the FBI just close it for everyone, including the Petitos, and say, yeah, that man actually did it wasn't just responsible for it he murdered her so it sounds to me like you're taking on advocacy for the petitos who are not only not complaining about what the fbi did they're applauding them and saying they did a great job i think that's phenomenal so they don't need any more they don't need what you're requesting and i think that what they've done is a decent job so then that leads me to my next question. Do they have any recourse here in civil action? And listen, yeah, you can't sue Brian for wrongful death. He's gone, but he did have $20,000. Again, he can't be a litigant. Can you go after the parents for any of their after-the-fact actions? And if there were something classified as an actual murder or an actual killing, would it have helped their potential case if they even can launch a case? Okay, so we start the analysis, the same place I start most of the time when people come to me with civil cases. Anyone can sue anyone for anything. Question is, would they prevail? Now, law enforcement, it looks like, aren't charging his parents with anything. So maybe they did absolutely nothing nefarious. And or there might just not be any evidence to prove it. So either way, it's going to be difficult for anyone to point their finger at the parents and say that they did anything wrong which then equals a payday in civil court. I always say we, we all have the right to remain silent and we don't have a duty to report uh, as, as you know citizens. Um, however, is there anything to the laundry's silence, their utter disregard for the pain and suffering and the emotional distress, arguably, that the Petitos went through while Brian was cooling his heels in his, you know, kitty bedroom back at that bungalow in Florida with mom and dad, and they wouldn't even answer a text or a phone call about the whereabouts of their obviously now dead daughter. Is there anything that they could sue for in terms of the pain the Petitos went to because of their silence? I don't see it. I, I don't. And I still don't even have his parents uh, thought process on this whole thing. So I don't like to comment. I was kind of harsh with them in the beginning because I thought that they were holding back. I still don't know that. And so, you know, until we hear their side truly, I think that we join the many in the court of public opinion who are willing to condemn without really knowing what happened. Well, there is someone else that the public's been very angry with, and that's the local police, because they didn't arrest Brian. Look, I learned a long time ago that probable cause, that the bar is not that high. That man, Brian right. Laundrie, came back from his trip with a van that didn't belong to him and it belonged to a missing woman, okay? Parents are frantic asking questions of police and family who are mum and not saying a word and not offering their son for an interview, to me, that is probable cause. You have a missing woman's van. Why wouldn't they have arrested him? Is there any recourse, not that the Petitos want it, but is there any recourse for them regarding how law enforcement fumbled? 
where I keep disagreeing with you tonight. I didn't want to. I want peace and serenity in my life, but I keep disagreeing with your premises. I don't believe in general that law enforcement tend to want to look the other way and not arrest someone if they have probable cause. I don't think that they had probable cause. I disagree with you. I think that you think that the bar is, I don't know, easier to make. I don't think that they had it. And by the way, you weren't privy to a lot of information that they were. If they didn't arrest, defer to them. And I believe they didn't have sufficient evidence to do so. So, no, I don't think anyone's going to mm. sue them for, for doing anything You're wrong. You're better at this than I am. However, I keep coming back to the laundries handing the officers a business card saying, talk to our lawyer. When they said, but Gabby's van's out front and her parents are freaking out and we, we just want to know what your son knows. And bup kiss. So for me, that, I don't know, I felt that was fair and probable cause. But at the same time, we don't have a, we don't have a duty. No. We don't have to talk. You know, we have the right to remain no. silent. And, and I'll represent you for free under the same circumstances and tell you, keep your mouth shut. They are looking at you like you're a suspect. And the fish who kept his mouth shut never got caught and or was it misinterpreted by law enforcement. So while we can crucify them in the court of public opinion all day long, that's what makes our First Amendment so wonderful. It's fundamentally unfair since we don't really know what they were going through and their motives for doing what they did. It's a good point. I do know that those cops missed Brian Laundrie driving out and thought he was his mother. To me, that one was frustrating. But you know what? You can't sue because you're Keystone cops. Mark Iglarsh, I hope you have a great weekend and you come back here sooner rather than later. My pleasure. You too. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, also tonight, just when you think that the charges against Alex Murdoch can't get any lower, they do a lot lower. South Carolina prosecutors today rolled out a whole new batch of indictments, 27 counts arising from Murdoch's alleged secret profession. But today might just be the bottom of the barrel. Watch the space on that one. But, you know, for years, while posing as a king among low country lawyers, Murdoch allegedly was siphoning insurance payouts that he'd won for his suffering clients. And this week, we brought you the story of the South Carolina trooper who was badly hurt in the car wreck. That's him on the bottom there. Uh, but he can't retire because Murdoch allegedly stole his settlement. Uh, despicable, if true. But just wait. Murdoch now stands accused of stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from the family of this young man, Hakeem Pinckney, seen in better days. Hakeem was deaf and the star pupil at the South Carolina School for the Deaf and Blind. But in 2009, Pinckney was in a car accident that left him a quadriplegic. Okay, this is bad, right? It gets worse. In 2011, Pinkney died, having spent the remainder of his life in hospitals. His family hired Alec Murdoch, you know, for the civil action. And the rest is history. Alec is charged with stealing from him. So now if you're counting, Alec faces 78 charges involving more than $8 million in attempted fraud or alleged fraud. He is locked up in a state jail in Columbia under a $7 million bond, and he cannot pay that bond. What a time to be alive. The 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s at Hugh Hefner's Playboy Mansion. That is, of course, if you were a guy. <laughs> the women put on quite a show, but really only now, decades later, are some of them coming forward and revealing the ugly side of the sex culture that they took part in. Rigid controlling rules, hidden cameras and blackmail, teenagers, some still in school, downing champagne and falling into bed with men three to four times their age, and the near constant coaxing that the pictures and video for Playboy were simply art, only to be sold afterwards to porn sites. These are some of the sordid revelations in A&E's new blockbuster docuseries, Secrets of Playboy. Really, he was a monster, the things that he got turned on by. The girls were passed around to Hefner's friends. They were shuffled off into the shadow mansions. VIPs assaulted and raped young women. 
There was a very powerful team protecting them. Sandra Theodore dated Playboy founder Hugh Hefner for five years, starting at age 19 when he was 50. She was the Playmo Playmate of the Month in 1977 and lived in the Playboy Mansion in the 70s and the 80s. She joins me live now to talk about the underbelly of the, the mansion culture, the way things were, and the way things became. Um, Sandra, it's great to see you. Thank you for doing this. And I know that we've got a bit of a delay, so I'll ask a question. It'll be a while before the audience uh, hears your answer. But tell me a little bit about, you know, 40 years of lore when it comes to the Playboy Mansion. What don't we know? Oh, well, so much. I mean, he, he painted his world the way he wanted everybody to see it. And, um, and we did have some great times. I mean, it, 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 there were some wonderful friendships made, and we had some fun. It was the 70s, and um, it was disco. Everybody was dancing disco, and, uh, and, it, and it had its glamour. But um, there was a dark side, and, um, and uh, half, half, uh, it was his... his need for more everything was he, nothing was good enough and uh so he wasn't satisfied very long and uh and he uh controlled the girls uh <laughs> he he had control of all of us, let's just put it that way. And um, Sandra, let me ask you this. That uh, you have an experience against, against that's one another. really unique. I can't hear you. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry, I was going to say, uh, you have an experience that, that's really Wait, unique uh, in that you you mm -hmm. met Hef, you met Hugh Hefner. I can't hear you. Um, when, oh, no. I can you hear, hear me you. now? Can, can you can hear me now? I can barely hear you. Oh, no. Okay, yes, well, let I me try. Barely, though. Okay, so let's try this. All right, you met Hugh Hefner when you were just 19. You went to a party with your friend, and you were offered your first glass of champagne, which you downed. He was um, mm -hmm. charming to you, picked you out of the crowd right away, and by the end of the night, you were in, in bed with him, and that was not the girl you were. Um, it, was this a, a one-off, no, or was this no, what you all, saw all the time? Pardon, what was that last bit? Was this a one-off, or was this something you saw repeated over and over in the years that you were his girlfriend? Oh, oh, no, well, well, no. Um, uh, well, he seduced me very, well, very quickly. Yes, he did. Um, he had all the trappings, and he said all the right things, and he began our fairy tale that night with um, walking in and, and dancing to Barry White. It was a very sexy song, and he ran up to the DJ and asked what the name of it was, and it was Baby Blue Panties. So you drop the panties, and there was my nickname, Baby Blue. And that became my nickname right away, and uh, my, my layout was t titled Baby Blue, and he featured me as his new girlfriend. So he made me feel special and... and uh, separate from the others right away and it, and I thought I had met my prince I mean he had he had all the moves down he had the romance uh, but the, but I learned later that that it was all practiced romance I, he loved the old movies and and it's like he memorized how to to make the facial expressions he, he was his own leading man let's put it that way but i watched over the years i watched the same fairy tale with another face it's always another face right because when i reached so, 25, and that's that's what a lot of them are saying is that there was always someone who looked uh, just like them blonde buxom uh and that you know hugh would just surround himself and if you were 24 you were you were getting to be too old let me run this little clip and yeah. it's about the drug culture at um at the playboy mansion it's distressing because we've heard of you know we've heard of drug stories before bill cosby there were allegations that he was using quaaludes against a, a mm -hmm. young underage girl at the mansion but i want to play this this one clip from uh from the a and e special that's coming uh, coming up this monday take a look Hef pretended he wasn't involved in any hard drug use at the mansion, but that was just a lie. Quaaludes 
down the line were used for sex. Quaaludes were, we called them the leg spreaders, you know, I mean, and I don't know that I want to get that crude, but that is what the whole point of them was, you know. They were a necessary evil, if you will, to the partying. So, uh, Sandra, that sounds a lot um, like rape. I mean, if you drug someone with quaaludes for sex, that's a that's a kind of a, a rape factory. Do you feel that that's an unfair description? Uh, well, well, no, well, yes and no. I mean, uh, what it does, it makes people do things that they would normally not do. So it, it was manip manip manipulative, but um, uh, it was. It was everywhere. Everybody was doing cocaine. Uh, um, I didn't realize it right away. I couldn't, I didn't know how come everybody could stay up so late and I'd fall asleep out in the game room in the chair while they played games. And it wasn't, it wasn't until later that the, the, the cocaine was introduced to me. And, and cocaine would make you love everybody, uh, happy, I and mean, you could stay up all night and talk about solving the world's problems, and, but in the morning it was like, what, what, what were we going to do? So it, it, when you were off the cocaine, the idea you came up while you were on it didn't sound so good, but, um, but it just made everybody do things that they would not normally do, and the guys yeah. knew this, and they always had it on them, and they offered it to the girls. And a lot of the girls got let me ask you, wrapped up in it. Let me ask you, Sandra, about the, um, the, the uh, this was such a distressing term that I heard, that there were certain parties that were called pig night. What was pig night? What did that mean? Well, um, at first I didn't know what was going on. I was just told to stay upstairs for a little while. And uh, and then a butler told me that, that it was pig night going on. And I'm like, well, pig night? What? And that's what they called it, the girls. Uh, they were they were scooped up at, uh, and, you know, two guys would go out in their cars and, and uh, go down to Sunset Boulevard and go into the restaurants and pick up young girls or wherever they found them down there. And they had offered them uh, an evening at Hefner's uh, for dinner. And of course they all jumped on it. And, um, and so um, they would be brought to the mansion and they would be served drinks and dinner. And then what they were really doing, they were liquoring them up and offering them drugs to, uh, let's just say, take them to slaughter in the, um, in the grotto. I was appalled by this. Um, that it didn't last our whole relationship because I was so appalled by it. And um, I found it just outrageous that they would first do this to these girls. and. I always wondered what about the girls that would wake up the next day after you know drinking and getting wild, how they must have felt being so used like that. And that's why one of the reasons I wanted to, to speak out it, for all those faceless women out there that were young girls and they were abused like that, that gosh, you know, I'm so sorry. It, it, it wasn't their fault. And these yeah, And I want to make sure that, that the viewers know. Like a candy um, shop up there for them. You were mentioning girls, but at the same time, and there were some, some new girls right. there. Sorry, I just want to make sure that the viewers know that while you were mentioning some of the girls that you said uh, they would go out and pick up on, on Sunset, uh, we were showing pictures of, of other uh, women who were not those, those girls. That, that's not who you were referring to. But, um, but, but Sandra Theodore, thank you for sharing your story with us. I appreciate it. I know it's not been easy and the, 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 the connection isn't good, but I sure appreciate talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little hard. Yeah. Okay, but thank you. Be well. So coming up after the break, you know, there's always another side, right? And I've got a guest who says that everything that you've just been hearing is all wrong. Brandy Roderick calls her Playboy years a wonderful experience, a learning experience. And she joins me live when we come back. Welcome back. The seamy side of the Playboy mystique is on full display in the A&E docuseries Secrets of Playboy, premiering on Monday on A&E. But that's not the only side. For more than a few playmates and female Playboy executives, those bunny ears meant freedom and self-determination. At that point in time, I wasn't interested in marriage. But I was interested in Playboy Enterprises because women were taking 
their power. They were in command of themselves. So I thought, well, wow, wow, that's good to me. It's 1981. I'm in Chicago as the bunny mother. I had 70 bunnies underneath me. We did a lot of things to help rise these girls up. And it was exciting to me because I knew that I could move up the ladder in corporate. My next guest says Playboy and its iconic founder were good for her, too. Brandy Roderick was a Playmate in the late 90s and Playmate of the Year in 2000. She dated Hugh Hefner for a year after that. And uh, then she launched a successful series of, uh, well, career in acting and in business as well. She calls her Playboy years a, quote, wonderful learning experience sisterhood in the true sense of the word. Uh, Brandy Roderick, thank you. Thank you so much and welcome to the program. I appreciate you coming on. So you heard the last Hi, interview. Ashley. You know the, the A&E series is coming out saying there were all sorts of icky things going on, but you have a very different um, feel for what happened when you were at the Playboy Mansion. Tell me. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for me it was, um, <laughs> I have a real fond and love for Hef. Uh, he was a is or was a wonderful person. Uh, I learned so much from him. I learned uh, about art. I learned about music, you know, big band and jazz and not, you know, smooth jazz, real jazz, uh, old classic films. Um, I learned, uh, I learned grace from Hef. That's one thing that uh, I learned and got to see firsthand is the way that this major iconic man who's super famous, would react with everybody. Um, he'd have people coming up to him and wanting to take pictures and talking to him, and he was just so graceful. Um, and that's something that you don't really see a lot of times from uh, celebrities in Hollywood. Um, so, Sandra, the pictures those, some we're of the showing, most amazing. Um, they, they show all these beautiful women, which is typically what we would always see, right? We'd always see a picture of half surrounded, either two, four, six, or eight beautiful women, and they all looked exactly the same. And I just wonder, from your perspective, how did that feel just to be one of them as opposed to someone special? Um, I felt very special. I was playmate of the month. I was playmate of the year. Uh, <laughs> I, I felt very, very special. Um, the fact that he likes blondes. I think some people have types. Some people like brunettes. Some people like blondes. His, he just happened to like uh, blondes. And then what about the the accusations and revelations of some of the seedier stuff that uh, that people say mm -hmm. happened, the quaaludes, which some of the people who were there said sure. were leg spreaders, there were rotating prescriptions, uh, the uh, the pig night, which was, you know, um, a, a collection of women off the street who mm -hmm. were, some were prostitutes, some were young people, plied with alcohol, uh, passed off to older men. What, what do you make of those allegations? Well, you're talking to somebody who is was there in the 70s. Um, for me, it was not like that whatsoever. In fact, uh, there was one night at one party when uh, security came to Hef and said there's somebody doing cocaine in the bathroom, a certain celebrity, which I won't mention the name, of course, but uh, he had them kicked out and never allowed up at the mansion again. He was very much against drugs. So I, maybe in the 70s they were having fun, I don't know, but from what she's explaining, it sounds like she's talking a lot about um, these men that go to the parties. I didn't hear her saying Hef is doing those things. What I heard her say is that all these men are around, the men are doing this, the men are preying on these young girls. How about the girls that are there preying on these rich men? I mean, come on, this, that's ridiculous. It's, it, it's natural. Oh, wow, they went down Sunset Boulevard to pick up girls? Are you kidding me? That's what everybody does. <laughs> you go, uh, the guys go to bars to pick up girls. They've been drinking for forever. I mean, that's what people do when they go out. So I, I, I don't, I don't know. And, and, and he swept her off her feet. I mean, I would hope that somebody would sweep you off your feet and dance. Well, I think some light. of the allegations are that that she was 17 um, at the time, or 19 rather, she was 19, at the time, that's and, what she and, just said, and yeah. had never had a, a glass of champagne before. And then boom, out she went. But um, I wonder if well, you feel but she was there for, at her free will. <laughs> True, true. And she was they were all there right. at their free will. Um, no one was holding a gun to their head. 
So do you, um, it must be very painful since you really, you know, have a fond, um, had a fond affiliation and a fond memory of, of Hugh Hefner. Do you feel that you have to defend his legacy because this is all coming out now? I mean, Holly Madison came out a few weeks ago saying that she'd had a, a bad experience there. Do you feel that mm -hmm. people like you has to, I, I feel, you know, have to come and help him out? Yes, I feel so sad that I even have to defend him because he is such an amazing person that's done so much for so many people human rights, civil rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, everything. And the fact that some women are coming out because maybe they what, have a book coming out, maybe they want another 15 minutes of fame, maybe they're out of it, whatever. And to do it now after he's dead where he cannot defend himself to me is disgusting. The fact that they would do that. Why not go and, and be on one of the other 500 documentaries that have been made while he was alive? and say these things about him. That's why well, you've I never heard anything you, bad you know. all these years from anybody, because yeah. he's not those things. Well, I do appreciate you coming on you with know, the well, other Harvey side of Weinstein, the story. That's what, you know, uh, you've heard over the years well, he's yeah, a scumbag. That, 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 that's a whole other kettle of fish. Those are charges that were, yeah, were proven in a court of law, and he's um, you know, sitting, sitting exactly. pretty in, in jail exactly. at this point. But Brandy Roderick, yeah. thank you very yeah. much. I appreciate your perspective, and uh, thank you, Ashley. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And I should you. mention as Bye -bye. well, those clips that we aired, uh, you can catch the A&E docuseries Secrets of Playboy that's starting on Monday uh, this coming week. And still to come, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Coming to America, and Family Feud. What is the one thing that these three film and TV classics have in common? You will know in just a minute or two. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.